Alrighty, everyone. Hello and welcome here to Town Hall Overwatch Episode 2. My name is Solid Jake, your host, and here I am joined with my co-host, Ask Joshi, and our guest this week, Spo. Welcome, my friends. Hi. hey -o. Well, Spo, this is, of course, your first time on the show as well. It's the second episode, and that's where new appearances happen. So why don't you give everyone a bit of a update or just a rundown as to everything about you? Um, okay. Um, I, in real life, I, am a motion graphics designer, I do a lot of art stuff. So I do things like broadcast packages, commercials, my brand websites, my brand companies, things like that. So I do a lot of that. Um, I recent, most recently I've been doing stuff with, uh, one club and doing a lot of the, the branding for them, uh, and graphic stuff for them, uh, for game wise. Um, I've played several different titles. I, I don't really stick to a specific genre. I know some people tend to say, hey, you know, I'm more of an FPS player or maybe an RTS player or, or what have you. Uh, for me, I have backgrounds in multiple games, uh, competitive levels or on the, at the competitive level in multiple games. I've played things like, uh, I used to play uh, WoW professionally. Uh, so I went to uh, events like MLG. I went to, actually ended up going to DreamHack once, which is really cool. Um, now BlizzCon, things like that. So that was really, that was really awesome. Really cool experience and getting to meet a lot of people there. And they get to let us see those same people in Overwatch. Um, I've also uh, you know, play, had a lot of competitive experience in, um, uh, for example, Counter Strike. Uh, I did a lot of stuff with Hearthstone as well uh, within oh, wow. the uh, first year. Um, yeah, I just I, I I played pretty much everything. I did a lot of RTS too. Played a lot of Warcraft Three for sure. That was a lot of fun. Had a had a fun time playing that too. So. So you've been around the block. That's yes. for sure. Very yeah. similar Game to me. Gamer of all genres, it sounds like, too. Um, World of Warcraft arenas and Overwatch actually have some similarities with, uh, like, tank classes, for example, always come to mind when I play Reinhardt. Um, yeah. I'm imagining playing a, a warrior, arms warrior, or something like that in arena. Um, but you, yeah, I would say you've got quite a few uh, World of Warcraft accomplishments. What FPS, what would you say was your strongest FPS or the one that you maybe enjoyed playing the most? Mm strongest FPS is probably Counter-Strike. I used to scrim for Cali teams uh, a lot. But that was that was really early on. That was... <laughs> I was think it was like early 2000s. Um, so I was only like 14 or 13 Same. around then. Yeah. So <laughs> it was... it was. I don't think I'd really fully matured yet. I really completely understood. I mean, like, I had mechanics down. But I think in terms of uh, some of the other aspects of my game, I just don't think those had fully fleshed out yet i feel like at a certain age you know certain you know you start to um at a certain age you start to develop those um key components i guess yeah your gaming sense. history sounds a lot like mine where we played a shitload of fps when we were 14 or 15 and then yeah. it was like blizzard games ever since then so yeah. overwatch overwatch obviously has that same appeal for you where it's like blizzard's artwork and creativity and all that merged with yeah. fps which you just enjoy as a genre so oh yeah uh, and team games uh like just the fact that it's 6v6 is is also really fun um you know that's do, you, actually, do you agree basically <laughs> it's so interesting because it's like the same exact story for me grew up on a lot of halo a good bit of call of duty mainly console shooters but the blizzard appeal like i just can't resist this game man it's it's too it's too <laughs> beautiful and it's too fun it's too good yeah. So, Joshi, I need an update. Have you hit level 100 yet? Yeah, I did actually hit level 100 <laughs> a couple nights ago. I've been streaming uh, consistently for, I think, my shortest stream actually since beta came back was seven hours. Uh, so, I apologize for that short, you know, <laughs> abrupt end. <laughs> what a but, soft um, core. <laughs> honestly, like, the game I would be playing anyway. Um, my friends list is like perpetually full because I keep hitting people like new people in lobbies that are just really good at the game or um, really communicative or whatever and it's just like I have to constantly purge the freaking friends list I wish Blizzard would separate them out by game now since they have like six huge titles uh, full of people that I want to play with so I'm running into that issue but honestly the game is super fun. I would be playing it anyway and might as well be streaming it as if I'm trying to essentially change my lifestyle to work from home rather than this L.A. commute. So um, might as well keep streaming, and I'm going to. So, <laughs> yeah, I would, don't, don't feel like slowing down yet. Yeah, because I know Steam allows you to do that. They allow you to make different tabs for your friends list so you can categorize oh. them by game, which is really nice. Um, I mean, it would definitely be nice 
<laughs> even that would be helpful. Yeah. I think it's it's almost time for Battle.net 3.0, but that is a a whole nother topic that we'll save for another day because we could go on and on and on about that. But guys, we're going to be talking about, well, just basically week two, an update on the state of the game here for what everybody's feeling about Overwatch, both the just the average player and then, of course, everyone in the competitive side of things. We're going to be going through a map callouts, a big post that Spo actually just made. It, it's super, super elaborate. Going to be taking a look at that and... It is actually a phenomenal, super useful resource. Uh, we're going to be talking about rule sets. Rule sets like the the differences that we see between ESL and the Gosu gamers, and what we're you know kind of what the community likes better. What you guys think about those two rule sets, and then just a community roundup, pretty much general banter. That's pretty much what the show is going to end with. Lots of banter, but let's talk about you know week two. We're now we're now in the second week of the game. Um, what are you guys feeling? Is the game exactly where you guys want it to be? Does it feel like it's getting stale? Do you feel that there's there's things that you've you've changed your opinions on about the game? Like, what's your overall thoughts? Uh, you can go ahead, Spo. Okay. Um, I think well, the, the meta has definitely been changing a lot. Um, it did a lot in the beta. I would say it did as much in beta one. There was a lot of a lot more standard play in terms of you know having the McCree as a staple or Pharah as a staple. They always seen there's always the Pharah Mercy combo. Uh, you always saw the Reinhardt, always saw Lucio and stuff. Now I feel like you're seeing. I think people are still. It's it's only been a couple of weeks you know since the the beta really came back online. So I think people are still figuring things out. We've seen different comps from week to week. I mean the last weekend we saw a lot of uh, especially in the NA scene a lot of a lot of Devil Winston Devil Reaper shenanigans. Uh so that was interesting. Sometimes even Devil Lucio where Lucio's in the artist. We saw a lot of that. Um and whether that's healthy for the game or not, I guess is another uh something to go into later, I guess, but um Certainly, it's. I don't think it's going to stay that way. It's. It's. You're not going to. I don't think you'll be seeing this. You know, uh, even maybe even next uh, this coming weekend, people are going to find counters to things. It's just a matter of time. Um, I don't think the community at large, you know, whether it's tournament organizers or uh, players and stuff, should really be making knee-jerk reactions to the. Um, you know, to last, to last weekend's uh, tournament, you know, the NA, the NA scene at least. I, that's it's we saw it was a lot more prominent in there. The double Winston, double Reaper uh, stuff. Um, well, that was more towards the the end of the bracket, right? The the higher level teams were running pretty similar comps. Uh, yeah, but even in scrims and stuff too. Before the um, tournaments that weekend, there had been a lot of that too. So a lot of the some of the at least some of the uh, most of the teams that we had scrimmed had been actually playing those types of comps. So in going into the tournament, we knew that those were going to be um, those would probably be uh, frequently played. I, I guess we should say. Well, considering this is a beta test, this is when right. Blizzard's going to be tuning the game pretty actively. I mean, they've already shown that they're willing to patch even a day apart. Um, how long do you think they should wait? Like, I mean, this is a testing phase. Do they wait two weeks and it's consistently very strong? Do you think that's enough time? Do you think they need to wait three weeks? Like, what do you think the money spot is? Hmm. I, uh, I would at least give it a, at least give it a couple weeks. Um, it's you know, the meta. Things don't always change right away. I mean, we saw how I don't remember how long Genji was actually out for. The new characters were actually out for uh, before. Uh, was About, it was it halfway through the beta? They the came beta out phase? after BlizzCon, so that was November eighth ish, and the beta went away. December 10th, so the, Genji was only there for a month in Phase okay. 1. That's, yeah, that sounds about right. I was going to mention that because we didn't really see much Genji play at all until the last week um, in terms of tournaments and stuff. I mean, certainly people, people have been playing the characters, right. but in terms of actually seeing them in tournaments, we'd always been seeing the standard, you know, Reinhardt, McCree, Lucio, Mercy, Farah, and, yeah, you know, uh, the sixth the sixth class, or whatever, whatever other class that is. Um, so, We've been seeing more of a standard comp. There'd be kind of like a generally accepted comp of what to play. There'd been less variation, I guess. Um, and now it's, yeah, I think we're seeing that. I think it just we just need to give people time. I mean, that that took almost a month to come out from those characters being released. Now we're seeing the same thing. Maybe you should give it about a month. Um, but I think if you if people if Blizzard waits too long to act on it, um, or maybe the it. it it could be problematic. 
I'll agree basically about the uh, double Winston, double Reaper stuff. Honestly, it just it just came out of the box essentially. So, um, I mean, people knew, people already knew that it was coming anyway. Though, like in the uh, stream chat and uh, right. the casters just talking about it is like, well, we're definitely going <laughs> to see this this week. Uh, some people are giving credit to Seagull's team for coming up with it and uh, Tailspin's team for coming up with it. And I'm just like, I we did this in phase one because <laughs> Reaper, Winston, and Lucio are just the most ridiculous uh, survivability comp that you can do. Essentially, Winston can take out any sniper or Genji or problem character that exists for Reaper or Lucio. So, um, you know, one has speed on all the time to prevent getting sniped. One has healing on all the time to keep the high health pool Winstons and Reapers up. If uh, Reaper or McCree gets in close enough to kill the Winstons, your Reapers deal with them. It's just like a, <laughs> it's just a high HP, high survivability, high mobility. Everyone can teleport or wall ride or leap at whatever target they need to. Uh, it makes sense as a core anyway to have one of each of those. And so... Yeah, they basically just doubled up, and the the feeling I had was that most of these teams were just using that composition out of the gate, uh, it, just because it has a high versatility, it can deal with a lot of different compositions, and if they come out of the gate and then find out that the Widowmaker is wrecking them or whatever it is, then they can uh, you know, go with those <laughs> counter picks and switch off one of the Reapers to a Genji or whatever it is uh, to deal with whatever threat comes out of the, out of the door. So uh, it feels like it's just a... Some you know we're gonna see compositions moving forward that are just solid, the most solid comps that you can on defense because they're the ones who have to run a mile to get out onto the map. While offense can kind of just switch constantly to deal with that. Once they get a couple of picks, then they can set into a, a composition that they like and move forward. So even in public games that started getting really popular, where uh, just out the gate people will switch to mass Hanzo, mass Widow, and try to get picks, and then just literally take five steps back, switch to Farah Reaper, whatever it is, and and start pushing the payload um it's just it's becoming more and more common and it's something that i i think naturally was going to happen anyway um spo was talking about phase one we had basically reinhardt lucio was a ground combo and Farah mercy was the air combo that no one was really able to deal with yet now they know that winston and genji players have had enough experience that they can both deal with mercy and Farah in midair uh winston and genji can both deal with them so it's it's uh it's just gotten a little bit less uh, oppressive as a combo, Mercy Farah, especially with Mercy getting changed kind of frequently. Like during the tournaments this past weekend, Mercy was unable to fly to dead allies to try and get the money res. So we saw a lot less Mercy, and that's something you know also very easy to predict. And when Lu when Mercy's value goes down, Zenyatta and Lucio's value goes up. It's just as simple as that because they're the only healers. And uh, I would say some niche picks that I saw still still saw some Symmetra on defense. Occasionally you'll see a teleporter go down and it'll it's very boomer bust, so I don't expect to see her all, all the time. If a teleporter goes down and a tracer again she finds it immediately, basically you've wasted your pick and Symmetra's not gonna point. get a lot done. Yeah, yeah uh, otherwise. So um, I saw Seagull's Hanzo came out uh, and did a lot of work on a Hollywood payload map. Um oh, yeah. But other than that, I saw a couple of Torbs. Uh, Torb on defense of Hollywood A was the only successful Torb that we saw, and I think that was a, a kind of a mismatch um, anyway. Just one team kind of rolled through the other. Um, so nothing, nothing still too surprising. I think Genji Zen still comes out on occasion, but at the top we saw a lot of Winstons and Reapers, and that's something that we'll just have to be experimented with in, in scrims and behind the behind the scenes and stuff like that. Sometimes you can catch some scrims on Twitch, though, and those have been a lot of fun to watch. Uh, Pluppy TV has been streaming his, Taimu has been streaming his, and they're both incredibly good players on uh, IDDQD, um, that one of the top contending Europe teams right now. So speaking of just Torbjorn and Bastion in general, they received a pretty sizable, you know, change last week. You know, arguably a nerf, arguably a buff, and different situations. Well, not really for Torbjorn. How are they feeling? I mean, obviously they weren't very common and competitive to begin with, but are they are they viable after a week of play? Mm, um, I would I would say probably not really. I mean, you're not. It, they they would be more of a niche pick than anything. Um, I I know that back in phase one there were a couple instances where I think it was. I think it was uh, not Enigma at the time pulled out Bash and at like the end of King's Row or something like that to help make the final push, kind of as like an ace in the hole type hmm. um, type pick. But I think I think both Bastion and Torbjorn are kind of in that zone again. I'd felt like they were 
definitely a little too strong to begin with. Uh, they had, you know, Bastion had three and health, three hundred armor, I think it was. Yep. Um, <laughs> when they first released that, That's and nuts. then yeah, it was it was pretty insane. Uh, Winston obviously had no hope of killing killing him at all, zero chance. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was just it was incredible survivability, but maybe uh, maybe the nurse a little bit much. I'm not sure. I think it's just something that uh, the com- community has to play with to see see how the changes exactly play out. Like if it's you know say three four weeks down the line, if uh, those characters still are seeing zero play, then maybe maybe some you know maybe some changes can be made. I mean they're not the only characters that really haven't seen any play. I mean think about May. You know is May is May okay? You know is that is that a character that should be seeing changes? Um, Bastion. Yeah, Bastion for me, I feel like the health nerf, I feel like 400 or 450 would be kind of the sweet spot because that is the range that Tracer's Bomb can still kill him, and Tracer should be a viable counter to any character that stands still for the whole match, in my opinion. And when he had 600 health, you would drop his Tracer Bomb straight on him, and he would live, and then heal himself, and then shoot you, and still have plenty of time to do whatever he wanted. So 600 was obviously way too much. 300, he's a bit squishy, but I can still... Like I can still make the case for if you want to use Bastion, you have to use Teamwork because he is literally the most vulnerable character that exists. Torb can set up a turret somewhere and still run away from it. Mm-hmm. Bastion is just literally sitting in one spot. So if one person on an enemy team calls it out, you know, Widowmaker can just pop a few shots at him and he's gone. If you want to use Bastion on defense, you need to use a Winston Bubble or a Reinhardt Shield, basically, to keep him up. And I don't see any problem with that because there are other really strong synergies like Genji and Zen already that, you know, make sense. So uh, if you're going to use Bastion and you're trying to do it solo, then he's going to be weak. And if you're uh, instead getting Torb armor and you're cross-firing his turret and you've got a Winston Bubble or a Reinhardt shield that can kind of bounce between both a or Torb and a Bastion. Too. Or Zarya, yeah, Bazaria Bubble, Symmetra shield, anything to help Bastion just stick around longer. I feel like he still still shreds people and still does a lot of DPS. Uh, his sentry mode is, is pretty good now, so he can uh, just pop up and move whenever he needs to. Um, but in competitive play... You just don't want to have to give that much attention to one character. You want to have every single character be able to do as much as he can on his own. And again, that's what led to the Lucio Reaper Winston thing. They all have super high mobility, survivability. They can all get out of a pickle if they get you know rushed. Um, so, yeah, it makes sense to me that Bastion is is going to be harder to use competitively. Torbjorn still um, there's some cheeky turret spots, but I have seen <laughs> a couple of. Yeah. Uh, scrimmages where they're using Symmetra and Torb just to provide tons of life to everybody. Like Torb, someone described Torb as Reaper with armor uh, the other day because he his shotgun blast is just so good now. If you give yeah. if you give any tank a Torbjorn hug and sink three shots into him with right click, they'll they'll die. And uh, like Zarya ults now, Torb pops out and just shotgun blasts <laughs> everyone in a Zarya ult. I've gotten a couple of really really nice play of the games with Torb this week just from being in the right place at the right time. You you pop Molten Core, you do like a thousand DPS in, into a CC ult, so uh, he definitely could be showing up again. I think Torb could show up again. Yep. Bastion, not so much. Um, but yeah, that's that's it. And the Mercy change, I think they've already talked about reverting. Um, yeah, the other minor be. changes, I think Diva, Diva is more in line with what she used to be and actually a lot more fun to play again because her old generation actually kind of makes sense again. Um, and you can use her efficiently as like a harassing off tank kind of thing, almost like a reaper that they can't just kill. They have to run away from or, you know, get, get help with. Or you can um, use it to slam dunk the other team in pubs. Occasionally. Yeah. <laughs> you, can, you can sky drop. A, yeah. You, you can drop a bomb on them and just kill everybody unawares. Uh, yeah. She's really fun to combo with May ult as well. Um, Tailspin, I think, actually in the chat now did that against uh, did that against me in one of the pub games we ran into. He was playing Tailspin plays May all the time in pubs for some reason, but I think he's trying to work on that secret May tech I yeah. for so for matches. Yeah, <laughs> dude, that's the most exciting thing about like niche picks is when you see them busted out in specific situations and have a huge impact on the game, and that's like just a fun dynamic. So. I'm actually really excited that we do have those new options available that aren't going to be all that common because it makes that May pick that comes out that much more interesting and exciting right. in a competitive matchup. I agree. Yeah. But otherwise, um, competitive felt good this past week. We've had just a lot of different teams kind of show up and make names for themselves. Uh, Google Me 
basically came out of the gate swinging on Saturday with the, I believe it was the One Hit Club tournament on Mm -hmm. Saturday evening. Uh, They won that. Um, I also noticed that not every team is competing in every tournament like they were in Phase 1. It seems like they're being a lot more selective. Uh, Mostly, I would guess, because it's hard to get six people on at the same time to play for five hours. Uh, So Saturdays and Sundays are going to continue having just tons and tons of tournaments because that is the most likely time that you're going to get mass players available. Um, It's going to be harder to run weeknight tournaments on East Coast or West Coast. Like, There's a lot of difficulty with getting 12 players even in one lobby, let alone 10-plus teams. So, um, yeah, weekends weekends are going to be slammed. Teams are going to be picking what they play in very selectively, usually probably based on prize pool, maybe even based on rule sets uh, that they like or don't like. But um, I'm glad to see the amount of competition that we have seen and the amount of new faces that are in contention to actually win because it's kind of boring when you've got one top team or two top teams heroes i'm looking at you basically cloud nine and tempo storm fought each other for a whole (laughs) year until finally cloud nine actually beat them and that's i don't want that in overwatch i want I want I'm with you. five different teams. I, I mean, want six different teams. Look to at be what what, for what makes melee so compelling, and what made Brood War so compelling. It's like having these, like a good list of five teams or players that can dominate at any point in time, and you, it's always a toss up as to which of those five or six or so teams are very good. And that's you know, it, in early stages of the game, if we're already seeing some pretty even uh, matchmaking in terms of like these teams pairing up against each other, that's good because. If somebody comes out of the gate and you have one or two teams that just always win envious, yeah, they might they might be dominating uh, and playing very well. But they've shown they're mortal. Like in this past weekend, I went to game five. Uh, that in the finals, that's that's a good thing. That's a, if they three owed finals, that's I mean good on them, right, for being that much better than everyone else. But it's not good for the esport if one team is that dominant. I would have to agree with that. Yeah, and it's it's also good because it's there's new and new and interesting teams uh, coming up and. Um, I mean, with with every game, you, you I mean, you mentioned Brood War. It wasn't just you know Boxer or Nada at the top for ten years. I mean, it, it's it's swapped it swapped hands. Uh, there were different different players were were good at different periods of time, um, and you know the, the scene is always constantly evolving that way. And it's nice to see because when you get that that influx of fresh blood in the scene, and, and uh, it helps develop new rivalries, these new rivalries and things like that. And you get to see you know certain matchups, and and also I think. You'll see teams start to develop their in time for Overwatch, uh, like in other games. You'll start to see teams develop their own kind of styles. You know, not everybody's gonna be running the same comp. Some people may run, um, for, you know, for example, Google Me was a good good example, right? Sure, for we always see him on that Genji. Yeah. That's that's kind of that's their staple. That's their play style. Um, not every team runs that. Not every team runs a Genji. Some people, some teams run more standard. I know, like a lot of the uh, some of the even some of the European teams still run more of a. Uh, uh, I didn't really see too many uh, double double reaper double Winston shenanigans out of them. Um, not saying one meta meta is better than the other. They're just they're developing differently. And I think you'll see that with just teams in general too. Yeah, I think super strong hit scan players are still going to favor McCree. Uh, he he melts tanks just like a Reaper can, and um, he also has the added benefit of picking off a Pharah or a Mercy flying around. Mm-hmm. So uh, Reaper has a little harder time with that, but. Um, yeah, some scary good McCree play in in the last weekend of tournaments as well. Uh, Taimu is one player that I always like to uh, spectate his McCree. And some of the NA players are really, really scary good hit scan players as well. So uh, always fun to watch them bust out a McCree or Soldier and just light people up. Um, <laughs> but I will say in the kind of non-competitive community since I've been streaming so much and playing so many hours, I'm noticing that like skirmish times are getting longer. Um, I yep. think there's less less low level players like we could actually use some fresh blood i feel like uh a lot of people who have beta access are either getting discouraged by playing in solo queue and not having that teamwork ever that they that they want or um i don't know people people just burning out maybe but uh i think after a couple of weeks blizzard should send out some more invites so that you know basically we've got so many people watching that want in eight, 8 million beta signups. I feel like maybe we have 5,000 or less maybe actually playing <laughs> the beta. It feels, feels a right. little silly. There's... And they're going to have to stress test at some point. Like just, just start opening it up. Let, let some people in, get some more POVs, get some more, uh, 
you know, potentially competitive teams. People are saying, how can you have a competitive scene when the beta is so tiny? And they're right. I mean, honestly, oh, yeah. uh, right. we have these 10 team tournaments now, 16 teams in Europe or whatever, but that could be 100 teams, like in the blink of an eye, if, if we get uh, enough people in here playing. And I feel like um, it also, just the trends I'm noticing with the, with, casual play i feel like they blizzard could stand to add some features that allow you to uh, more easily see people in your games that you could party with um something based on maybe playtime or like uh if they actually showed mmr obviously that would be something that people mm -hmm. could be like hey we're at least similar level and we play at the similar times um let's let's make a party and and at least like duo queue triple queue whatever it is um because i feel like solo queue is is going to drive a lot of people insane in this game when uh yeah. they're either they're either trying to play a character that they're you know haven't spent enough time on and other people are just like trashing on them uh or they are being the nice guy and actually switching to Winston or switching to Lucio every single round just so they have some hope of trying to win and <laughs> they still have three Widowmakers on their team or whatever it right. is. And so that, that stuff can go... Dream. That, that stuff can drive you crazy. I totally understand. Yeah. Um, when, you, when you have that kind of casual play where it's like just nothing is nothing is helping you out as an individual player uh, to enjoy yourself. So, um, yeah, still, still some work needed on Solo Cube. Well, I uh, mean, that's partially going to fix itself i feel over time as people get more experience with the game because even now like you know i get in games and somebody's level 13 and you know you can say that's that's not that many games played they're not super experienced with the game um and you're going to expect a little bit less out of them so i think that's actually kind of a benefit you can look at their level and say okay this guy probably hasn't actually played that much maybe this is first time playing widowmaker you never know so that that's one benefit but in the future since we know they're actually going to be releasing in a ladder that ladder will fix a lot of those issues the people that are going to opt to play in ranked are going to be a little bit more try hard chances are they're going to be uh playing together um who knows if they'll separate the ladder from being full stacks or like Maybe there'll be like a full stack ladder and maybe there'll be like a, a less than full stack ladder. I mean, that's always a possibility. Mm -hmm. That's something that um, has been heavily talked about in Heroes of the Storm, how that should be handled. And right now, it used to be any group size, but now you're restricted to playing Hero League with, with a maximum of two people. Um, and then, then there's Team League where you can only play if you have a full group of five. So that's definitely something they could look to do in Overwatch, which the people that, you know, are, are really frustrated playing against a full stack of like you know six players that are super coordinated it doesn't feel good to get rolled that fast right yeah. you're solo queuing yeah. and you just got rolled that's frustrating and it's going to create the, those kind of woes but i think in the future the ladder itself should help remedy that quite a bit yeah, it's kind of weird oh go, oh, go ahead, ahead. <laughs> <laughs> spo spo take it spo first yeah. all right i was i was wondering if part of the problem is uh people downvoting uh, other players too because they still have that system in. I know there was one player in the uh, last beta who just just for just for giggles decided to downvote everybody he was in a match with and then eventually he could never find a match. Um, so he had to start you know re you know, refriending people and trying to get in groups to start Oh no. Uh, positive you know start oh, like the rate the positive. player I I, I never yeah, rate anyone. if you if you if you negatively rank the player it doesn't it won't pair you with them again oh wow so um yeah the system can kind of be abused right now in that way so <laughs> you know if you didn't want to play against hey this guy these guys are just playing a six stack let me go down vote them i mean not that you know i'm sure there's some people out there who do do that but certainly that limits the amount of uh people you play with um i know there's some people who like <laughs> uh there's some people for example during uh last uh last beta phase who would you know, if there's there was like a, someone picked a Torbjorn, and they would just automatically down vote them. <laughs> so I mean, maybe there's some, you know, maybe there's some people who start, you know, still do that with characters, but um, maybe they're in the mini minority. Who knows? Yeah, I was just gonna say that I I'm level one ten in game now, so Stop. like my presence instantly just gets people on the other team salty. They're like, oh my god, this is a, such a mismatch, and I'm like, literally, it's just hours played. Like I I could be playing. Uh, Roadhog or Zarya that I have like one hour played less or less and they'll still just be like this is unfair and I'm just playing with friends because they're my friends and we all just happen to be decent at the game sometimes we roll them sometimes we get rolled it's not like a, a guaranteed thing I, I definitely don't yeah. have that many more wins than losses after you know however many hundreds of games so um, it, it's it's just weird on both sides but I agree like the six stack versus six stack 
uh, or six stack versus solos can can be a little ridiculous. And people people leaving the game constantly and cycling back in means that they were never going to have a chance anyway. Like if one person even rages out, uh, then the other team just has no chance because we'll we'll just walk through when they're spawning basically. Um, but on the other hand, like six stack versus six stack, I don't necessarily want to play that all the time. I don't necessarily want to try super hard either, even though I am playing with friends. So it's there is a, a drawback there as well. Um, I think multiple queues will help. Someone in chat actually had the suggestion of since uh, since Overwatch does have roles, as in tank, defense, offense, and um, support. You could actually do a queue similar to League of Legends, where it's uh, I'm willing to play support or tank this round. I'm willing to play. I only want to play offense this round. I only want to play a defensive character. Whatever. The thing um, is, is like if you do that, are you going to be restricted within your picks in the client because that goes yes, against the I fundamental so. game design? So. If they did that and they said like, okay, you're going to click these two roles and then it's going to confirm you and then, but then queue times go up drastically. Uh, I don't Could know. Happen. There, there's some there's drawbacks, drawbacks to that. everything. Yeah. 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 Um, it would have to be something that they do later on, especially considering that scrimmage yeah, times are kind of long right now anyway. Once we have people in True. for sure. Yeah. Like this is a, a, a potential future investment, but yeah, I sure. do like the idea. On, hmm. on the surface, it makes sense to me where it's like um, some people really are a Mercy main or a Genji main or a Widowmaker main or whatever it is. And so hmm. if that person is uh, actually helping their team by filling a role rather than doubling up on a role or whatever it is, um, that seems nice, uh, at least for solo queuers. So we'll see if it ever does get to that point. It is something to keep in mind. But you're right also, Jake, that switching characters is a fundamental part of it. Um, perhaps... Yeah, and I, and actually, that's another tough part is because like a, a three tank comp certainly can beat out a, a two 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 or whatever it is on control maps or whatever. There's mm -hmm. there's just so much variety in maps and character selections that it is also very hard to uh, pigeonhole someone into a even just one role for for a whole game. So that is tricky. Maybe not. We'll see. That's on Blizzard's shoulders at the moment. Yeah. I'll, I'll try and give some other good ideas for them, but it's really it's really up to them to make sure everyone gets the best. Uh, play experience well i mean that's a i think it's a pretty solid update for everything here just revolving the state of the game obviously blizzard has only done one additional beta wave and i think it was asia targeted so hopefully we yeah. see more yep. more beta invites soon i'm sorry for all you only watchers hopefully you get your invite sooner than later uh moving on i mean spo i'm actually going to let you take the take the driver's wheel here or drive oh boy. Is, that, is that a term take the driver's wheel we're going to go with it and uh, this is this is really a segment all about you because you just made this big post about map callouts, mm -hmm. and uh, let's take a look at it here. I'll link it in the chat. All right. Oh, they we're, got it. we're not on the we're on the website, but we're at the tournament. We're so close. <laughs> there we go. Is this a tweet? I'm the worst. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we did Great success. It. All right. So map callouts for Overwatch and their importance, part one. Mm -hmm. Take us away. Okay. <laughs> so I mean, the idea behind it was that on a lot of other, a lot of the games uh, in the past, I'll, I used Counter Strike as an example in the article, is that you have a lot of the callouts have just kind of. For example, DD for double doors is uh, is, just, is common in Counter Strike, or you know, long, using terms like long and short and mid, are those are more common as well. But there's always people always manage to label things in games to help communicate or relay information to other teammates, and even and this even goes on beyond just actually playing the game. I mean, if you're a, any any kind of team, whether you're a pro team or an aspiring team, or maybe you're just you just on a you know just a competitive team with your friends and you just you don't want to play in you know leagues or tournaments or whatever and just play the occasional game um still it's if you're in practice at all too or if you're let's say there's a widow maker somewhere i mean you want to know where she is i mean rather than saying oh she's she's up in the building okay what building there's like five buildings here be more specific so i mean be able to say okay you know she's in this building you know hey she, she, she's in the, the red building or whatever okay that makes sense i know where the red building is uh as i play a lot of zenyatta and some of the other supports and you know, it's it's good for me to know where some of these characters are sometimes because you know I don't, I don't really don't want to peek a corner and get one shot by her. Um, uh, so I'm sure, or just you know, or just get killed, you no know, flat out killed as any as some of the other characters you know, get domed as uh, some of the other characters. You can die too. So um, it's it's all it's all relative, I guess. 
but there's there's one there's map callouts for five different maps. I did all the payload and payload hybrid maps. Um, so there's, uh, I think in between most of them have like seven to eight pictures each, all detailed with uh, the med pack locations, names of zones, and things like that. This is by no means a perfect list of um, you know exactly what everything should be called. Or I'm sure the community will find some uh, find some terms for other. Uh, just some of the locations and settle on those. That's fine. This is just giving a, the community a good starting point. Hopefully get teams and people more organized. Just, I guess, just putting a step forward or putting a foot forward rather. No, this is awesome, dude. Like you have no idea how beneficial this is because like you said, in my comms, as someone who's particularly new to FPSs, especially mm -hmm. in like actually playing in a, uh, an environment where I'm trying to communicate with my friends because I used to play a lot of other games with my brothers, but it was right. just you know, pub stuff. But now we're taking a little bit more seriously. We're trying to communicate. We're really trying to win. And, you know, we're just saying, we, fair up is probably the most, most communication that we get in our matches. Fair up. <laughs> and that's, that's about it. Like, we're, we're right. awful. So having good terminology like this, and it all, it's all very, very logical, and they're, they're short terms. Connector, the longest word here. I'm not going to say that. It's so long, man. Right. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But, no, this is great. This is actually just fantastic. And it's really beautiful. I mean, obviously, you made all these graphics yourself, I assume? Yeah. That's a lot of time, man. A lot of coloring. It's, uh... it's beautiful. What yeah. program did you use to color these? I oh, just Photoshop. Oh, okay. That's I actually cool. had to split them up into multiple. Each map had to be its own file because the files got pretty large, yeah. I guess. I mean, it's very detailed. All right. I, yeah. Hopefully, even if I mean, I would assume that even people, maybe even people who are, haven't even gotten the game yet, maybe this help people learn the maps or even just learn some of the layout. Because I know that even some of the overhead shots, just it's really hard to see anything, especially on some maps that have that are you know half indoors and stuff. I mean, even Dorado, right? I mean, the last point is completely indoors. If you're doing an overhead shot of the entire map, all you see is that giant pyramid on the left side right yeah that's the, that's the last point so you can't actually see in it both sky is the same way that last point's completely indoors so you'd need a different angle anyway so i try to give different angles on a lot of these different maps um, so people can understand where where all the med pack locations are and that's that's really helpful helpful for players too um so you know hopefully people no matter what no matter whether they're in the beta you know on a competitive level, whether it is casual players, whether they don't have the beta yet, but they're looking to play, we're hoping to get in soon. Hopefully, they all can benefit from it. Yeah, I've been um, trying to name some locations and stuff too. I noticed, like on Hollywood, we have a lot of the same ones, just like yeah. bank, saloon, hotel. They just we label whatever the building is. Yeah, that's, that's security <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, even like the, the the checkpoint guide though is super useful too. Yeah. yeah, I don't. There might be some people who don't even know that. The, of course, Gibraltar maps actually not ten minutes. You'd so. be surprised how many people yeah. don't know that kind of stuff. Most I, I, when I first started playing the game within the first week, that's that's when I found out. But I didn't find out right away. I thought everything was ten minutes because you know most of the maps were ten, you know, just are ten minutes long. And then there's just Gibraltar's like, oh, Gibraltar's a little bit longer. They just, it's just a, it's just different. So, um, yeah. Even on the the new maps, uh, Nepal and Lijiang Tower, I've been just. We'll we'll be playing, and I'm like, it's the left side of the point. No, the other the other side of the like tunnel, right. like hallway, the hallway, the hallway. There's only one hallway. You gotta you gotta understand hallway, right? Like, right. We're so we're just like making up terms as we go. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, it is. It's very fun to just come up with callouts and stuff like that. And um, now that you've actually assembled them all together, it should be a very useful resource for uh, people at solo queue, especially at least to try and get yeah. something unified. Um, so very, very valuable stuff there. What other stuff have you actually um, worked on in the past besides uh, this map guide? For for like Overwatch articles and yeah, stuff? Yeah, for over Overwatch-related content. Um, I've worked on some things. Uh, some of them were like more, I don't say opinion pieces necessarily. We're kind of exploring. Uh, one of them was on cosmetics, kind of like what kind of cosmetics we could see in the game. I know I touched on. Um, multiple different things. Some of the things we even see now, uh, like um, I, I touched on some things that we see in past games. Like for example, uh, they have in, in Counter Strike, they have like a when you get a, when you get a, like a play of the game, whatever it plays like an anthem, kind of like a five second Ooh. little oh, yeah. <laughs> music daddy that you can buy different ones, right? And so it'll play if you get the MVP of the round, it'll play like your little five second. Um, it'll say you know so and so is the MVP of the, of the round, and then it play like trumpets you know, play, or whatever. Yeah. 
exactly. <laughs> so things like that. Yeah. I um, mean, in, in Counter Strike, I'll stick with Counter Strike. I guess you see stickers on guns, right? That's another. That's another popular thing. Um, yeah. And they even use them for events too, right? And you can you can support your favorite team or support the event. Um, things like just just simple things like that, which are you know really cool. Yeah, we talked um, about so, that a bit last week. I'm I'm hoping yeah. for spray paints or stickers or skins yeah, we got based around events. Are great. Oh, that, yeah. that'd be so good. Those are awesome. Fingers crossed, it, man. Event specific <laughs> stuff. Yeah, yeah event cool. and team. The, the play of the game intros are actually a lot of them are really cool too. Mm -hmm. I think I think Blizzard team did an amazing job on those. Yeah, Blizzard art team and the Forge and video, just everything they've always just excelled at, and that's why they're the highest, uh, you know, highest selling PC company ever. Just like every release they ever have basically breaks mm -hmm. records and it's it's mostly on the shoulders of their art team i think more so than like story or game design even um but yeah blizzard super amazing and i'm sure they will be able to offer some awesome cosmetics they've already hinted you know there will be new legendary skins for additional characters and stuff like that as soon as march and that's, that's like crazy. a week away so i'm excited mm -hmm. to see you know if genji gets like a cool like dinosaur legendary skin or something like <laughs> metal don't, raptor or something don't get my hopes uh, up no, nah, dude. There's there's gonna dude. be some cool stuff, no matter what it is. <laughs> well, that article can be found at onehitclub.com. We'll be sure to include that in the YouTube VOD. And if you're listening to the MP3, it's just one O N E H I T C L U B. One Hit Club, very easy. A great resource for Overwatch news, and they actually do a a weekly every weekend. So you can enter events there as well. And actually, I just want to do a bit of a shout out to pretty much the competitive foundations of this community. One Hit Club is is one of the bigger ones. Gosu Gamers, uh, another big one here, really starting the foundation. We see ESL uh, really starting to ramp up their events in EU, and they're getting ready for NA, I would imagine. And uh, Liquipedia actually just put a big post on Reddit saying, you know, they're they're recruiting for for people to really help the Liquipedia. They've they're, they're just building this foundation. I love that it's pink. Like I <laughs> I, 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 I thought it was like Valentine's Day when I first looked at it because it was actually valentine's day weekend zarya theme i know and yeah. then i was like wait it's actually just zarya themed um so i mean if you want to learn about events results uh a little bit of info on the heroes they've got a good it's a good resource and then uh but there's, then there's Overpone, which is also a great resource for this kind of stuff and then over fire i believe that is the name of it the ow fire ow fire um so like you know there's there's so many so many so many great resources uh, to learn about how to get better at the game, uh, how to how to just watch tournaments, check tournament results, everything you name it, it's there already, which is impressive. I love that there's a lot of initiative on the community's part to really uh, cover you know cover the bases that aren't by Blizzard and just really um, just a lot of passionate people out there, no matter what it is, no matter whether they're creating content like articles or they're doing uh, you know cool fan art and stuff like that. You can see people doing some cosplays, which is really cool. So it's, it's great to see people's enthusiasm, no matter what it's yeah. directed towards. And the game is great. I feel like most of these people trying to build communities and build tournaments and stuff like that would not be doing this for Paladins or you know other games that are just not as robust. And um, everyone's got high hopes for the future of this game based off the track record of Blizzard mm -hmm. uh, providing tournament support for you know WCS for the last... This is like their fourth year straight of the WCS system. Hearthstone World Championships, uh, WoW arenas are still getting their time at BlizzCon at least. Like, I mean, uh, they're Blizzard more focused on WoW arenas. It feels. Yeah, well, that's because they they were kind of down in the dumps for a couple of years, letting uh, StarCraft II build its scene. And like even 2010, when StarCraft II was had yeah. just come out, WoW kind of bounced out of MLG. They didn't even get yep. their season final. So like basically they just got replaced but you know blizzard obviously still has a lot of money and a lot of resources in team two so it makes sense to try and keep the wow arenas going as well uh, as long as people are willing to compete so uh mm -hmm. yeah basically blizzard wants their games to last forever and overwatch should be no exception should still get plenty of uh support even as uh, in my opinion as early as this year if they're shooting for that spring release uh they did the similar release with heroes last year where they still had a tournament in june july and august well, to get people to go to blizzcon so that's i'm still feeling like they're gonna have some competition yeah. at blizzcon this year could be a million dollars because six people are on a team and that's just equitable i don't know could happen let's just rewind to last year heroes launched in june dorm happened couple months before that so they actually was, had yeah, heroes of the dorm 
uh, yeah, April through, I think it was April and May. It was like the whole month of April, yeah. Yeah, it was like April and ended in May. So they did that. Game launched in June. They did a couple launch events. They did a thing at YouTube in LA and they did a thing in London. Um, and then they had, like you said, all the qualifiers that led into BlizzCon. So I would be shocked if we did not see a Overwatch tournament at BlizzCon this year. Uh, yeah. I would expect them to announce some form of a, a circuit or or just a series of online qualifiers that lead into like regional regional land events uh, that all build into to BlizzCon for the end of the year, and I think that's kind of what everybody's hoping for because of Blizzard's track record. Yeah, I I definitely it'll be <laughs> putting on some type of tournament. There's the time frame too. The time frame is great as well. Like you said, I mean it's on or before June 21st. I think it is. That's the yeah. That's, that's the, date. the date they've given everyone as like a, it's out yeah. by then. So and BlitzCon's at the it's usually at the beginning of every October, first week of October, or second week. Yep. So that's that's a good amount of time for people to start getting accustomed to it. Start doing, uh, I, I guess, Blizzard sanctioned tournaments. I'm guessing is that they would be the ones putting that on, um, unless they outsource it to ESL or something like that. They uh, could. They, they definitely could. did at some point. Or MLG. There, I mean, they hey they they acquired MLG. My guess is actually they would be doing that instead, wouldn't they? Yeah, MLG um, has a studio in Columbus, and MLG yeah. has a background in FPS. Uh, but ESL has worked closely with Blizzard a lot of yep. the last couple of years, so it's really up in the air. But that's a good thing. That is a really good thing. And I just want to, like, this is kind of rant mode here, but, like, I expect Overwatch to have so much more support and diversity for North America in particular compared to something like Heroes, because Heroes is pretty much ESL and Blizzard. And there's, like, mm -hmm. a few dream hacks in Europe. Uh, but it, it's pretty restricted. Like, nobody got involved, but I can tell you, like, just on off a hunch that UMG, MLG, just about everybody, Gfinity, they're all interested in Overwatch because shooters are like, I don't, the audience is, is definitely different. And the fact that this game is multi platform is really, really, really big as well because that expands the audience quite a bit. Yeah. And that's something that's kind of like an unknown right now. Um, Activision obviously has all the experience with console FPS that they could lend toward. You know, making sure huh. Overwatch is successful That's on console. But Blizzard, their console track record is we also put Diablo on console. And <laughs> it's not <laughs> like... Lost Vikings. La, yeah, but I mean, Rock like in the, last, in the last decade, it's been, oh, we can also port Diablo because it's such a simple game and premise that we can actually just pop it over there and you have so, four buttons and you do four abilities, so... It's one, interesting. One thing that's really cool about that, though, is just the flexibility of PC. Like, if you're an Xbox player and you go to a tournament and it's a PC tournament, plug your USB controller into that PC and use your controller, and the problem solved. Same deal for PS4 True. players. The USB adapter, plug it in, and you can play that way. And as long as tournaments for, like support that and, and make that an option for players and they can customize it, sure, it might add a little bit of... Well, no, it, the same same amount of downtime as somebody to get their mouse settings set up. Um, so I think that's a great strength to just the power of a PC. Master race, master race, my friends. <laughs> <laughs> All right, should we move on yes. to a, a rule set discussion? All right, guys. So this is um, a very early game, right? It's the beta is brand, brand new, more or less, after, or the return is at least. And we're already seeing some pretty... Uh, big differences, a few really massive differences in terms of tournament rule sets. And, and, you know, we'll get to all of those points, but just looking at this graphic that I put together quickly, this is basically two of our, our main, major events. We've got Ghost of Gamers and we've got ESL. And both of these organizations have already created a system to basically drive the, the pick ban phase of the map. So you're not actually drafting heroes. You're actually just simply drafting uh, the maps and like there's a I actually couldn't figure out how to get to the I think you actually have to have an active game going on ESL to access it but this is pretty much uh, how what it looks like you've got a list of maps and then you, you click to ban and with the ESL system you will ban until there's only five five maps left and then you will choose the order in which each map is played so you'll choose five maps and so in the theory of a it is a best of five event and you would choose basically exactly which order those maps would be played in. This is very similar to StarCraft II, right, Joshi, where all of the maps yeah. are predetermined? Right. Yeah, so in StarCraft II and, and other games, basically you just veto maps until you're left with a pool. Um, Ghost of Gamers is doing differently where you go into OW Draft uh, each time, and you can actually repeat maps, so they veto all the way down to one map, and you could end up with King's Row three times in a row, which... Didn't happen, 
you know, that often, but there were enough times where it happened this weekend where people were frustrated at it, where it's like, why are we seeing Gibraltar again? Literally, that team just lost here. So it's it's silly, I think, to have to repeat maps when we have 10 available. Um, Obviously, like the double cap maps, Anubis, Volskaya, and Hanamura are still out of favor, but we've got, you know, seven, seven more beyond that, so we should be seeing more variety, in my opinion. I don't really like... Uh, also, I don't really like the downtime between each game where it's like, let's pop out and do this draft thing again and make sure everyone has the link and make sure right. production's all ready for it. It's like, I I prefer the setting of let's just get it down to a pool that we're going to play and maybe uh, either predetermine the order or even have like uh, loser picks. So first game, you know, first game's on Dorado, loser picks out of the remaining four for game two or whatever it is. Something like that where you don't constantly have to bounce out of the lobby and get everyone to, to be on the same page multiple times in a, in a BO3. It's just not necessary. I like ESL's take on it a little bit more. But the oh, it, OW Draft website beautiful. is really cool. It's yeah, <laughs> this website And it does have kicks future ass. functionality too for banning yeah. heroes or whatever. Uh, I just, so they've, they've already built that in too. I, th- I think I'm with you though, just from from an, like a production standpoint. I mean, somebody yeah. that's worked in production for so long in esports, mm-hmm. um, logistically, the way ESL does it makes so much more sense. But OW Draft is just so beautiful, right? <laughs> I want to show this on broadcast because it looks so good. It's such a well crafted website, and it's it's a nice experience to watch. But I, I wish I only had to watch it at the start of the best of three or best of five or whatever. I agree with you there. Yeah, it's a very it's a very clean look graphically. It's very simplistic. It's very, it's not it it's it's very well present. It's a very presentable. But the, I think I have to agree with you both, you guys as well. Um, I do like being able to have a you know have a pool of maps that you ban or have some maps that you ban and then from then choose uh choose from a pool of maps and what actually gets played. I think that actually allows for a little more variety too. I know that um, like you said about the king's row. I mean, a lot of people. Some some people you could even ban out all the control point maps. You're like, yeah, I don't want to play any of the cough maps. Yeah, I don't want to play the control point maps. Or maybe if you're lucky enough, you just ban out all the uh, the payload maps, and you can end up on something else. So it's, I would rather. I think you'd be seeing a little bit more, um, more diversity if people were actually able to pick and ban maps. And I think it puts a little a little element of strategy into it too. Oh yeah, definitely. When you see different teams, I mean, different teams start to gravitate towards certain maps. Like maybe you know that. Uh, you know, maybe you know that. Hey, Envy's good on on uh, Nimbani. We got we got you know they're really good there. That's their, you know, we haven't be- really beaten them there in scrims. Let's ban that. Uh, just things like that. I mean, a lot of these teams scrim. A lot of these teams on EU and NA, you know, they're scrimming each other in their respective regions. So a lot of them know maybe that su- they're stronger or weaker on on specific maps, or maybe maybe you feel that your team isn't as strong on one of these maps. So you can actually you go out and ban those rather than just ha- you know having all these lists of like you said, every round, just banning all the maps. And a lot of times it gets down to the same map. And uh, it just isn't exciting that way. So I wanted to ask the the two of you, uh, we have those two options, but I guess the third theoretical option uh, that could be brought into it is basically you have different game modes designated for best of three. So game one is always a payload. Game two is always a capture point. Uh, and I mean, do you guys think that would be like a compelling way to do it, especially as like, Blizzard potentially adds more game mode to the game? I have no problem with it. I actually watched, uh, you know, Halo when it was kind of in its prime. Yep, me too. Um, mostly when StarCraft 2 was new to the MLG circuit and I was going to these events for the first time, Halo was the big game. StarCraft was like yeah. one bench. So uh, <laughs> the don't, you know, don't worry, that's Halo famous line from Huck where the the StarCraft crowd is actually cheering for him building a mothership. I remember that, yeah. Uh, because Halo constantly, just throughout the first like three MLG tournaments, would just totally overshadow well, the StarCraft uh, that Star noise. That had literally two benches in a yeah. corner. <laughs> it was like wedged in the corner, and there was legitimately two soccer benches right. that you'd see in a yeah. field. Like It went from two to six to like ten, and then finally we got like a thousand chairs at the next year. In yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> even even um, finals in Dallas, where StarCraft had its own room, there was still yeah. like maybe ten. Benches. So they weren't they exactly. weren't in the closet this time. Is what you're trying to say. <laughs> it was a big. It was a big dark closet. Um, yeah. You could actually walk right past it the whole event and not know that it was there, which was still not great. But <laughs> right. um, but yeah, Halo. Anyway, back to my point. Essentially, they do a mixed bag of games where it's like uh, Slayer and 
you know whatever the three other modes were but essentially you saw a light you saw a large variety flag, you know yeah, yeah and i i think that's cool i actually like the i love the it. mix bag and cap um call of duty does the same thing so it seems like console esports are more used to running various game modes rather than just the one mode to to rule all modes um so i think overwatch certainly could fit with that especially since it's going to be a console shooter like uh pc hardcore you know people who have to get all their perfect customization and settings you, you're gonna have to still remember this game will be played on console by million plus people so uh it's going to be a little um it's going to be hard for you to get it exactly the way you want it i guess as, as i'll just give that preemptive warning once again where uh, console is going to be a big deal for blizzard to, to make sure that they're supported and pc is going to have some detriment because of that it's going to be really interesting to see what that divide looks like. I mean, North America known for having a larger audience on console for shooters just in general, I'd say. I mean, sure, CSGO does have a massive, massive audience. That's not to discredit that whatsoever. But just when you look at uh, Call of Duty, look at Halo, it was always bigger in NA than it was anywhere else in the world, whereas it's always been a little bit more prominent for PC shooters in Europe. So I'm excited to see that how that's going to translate. Mm. Uh, all right, getting back to the rule set discussion, uh, matches. So, I mean, this is just a pretty standard thing. Best of threes for the whole event here on the Go- Gosu Gamers Tournament and best of five finals. ESL, they're they're really just prepping for large events. They're, they're thinking, you know, especially once this game goes public, there's going to be a lot of teams signing up. So they're just going with best of ones until the semis to best of three and then best of five. Um, I think it's probably pretty easy to get cheesed out of a match in a best of one. So yeah. a lot of teams probably not too happy with that. Best of I'd one agree. is pretty rough for Overwatch. Here, I'll let you go for it, Spo. I, I was going to say that it's it's not as bad as, say, maybe in Hearthstone, for example, the best in ones in Hearthstone, because considering it's the RNG is uh, certainly more prominent <laughs> in that game. Uh, but best in one, still, like, yeah, you can feel cheesed, or maybe you just, maybe they just had a better run on a map. Uh, maybe they had the map of their choice. Uh, who knows? It just so, sometimes you can't win the you can't win every game. Sometimes you're just the other team plays a little bit better. Sometimes you get outplayed, and I, I do think that having a best of three, best of five is a lot better. Being able to play on different maps, uh, being able to be given essentially a second chance. I mean, it's a single elimination tournament already. Maybe best one would be okay if it was double elimination. Right. Uh, earlier in the tournament, I could see that. I mean, that would still be tactic. Uh, the, the one and done feels so bad. It feels yeah. so bad to drop out after losing one payload map. Yeah. Imagine if you lost in like four minutes. Like you're, you're setting your day aside. You're going to go play in this tournament. Your team's all pumped up. Yeah. Oh, we got rolled by Envy. This feels awful. Yeah, I um, don't. It just seems difficult. Like it seems harsh. And I never, I never was a fan of best one of in any kind of competition. Just. Just feels bad, man. Like yeah. um, even single limb tournaments, I'll, I'll never forget. Uh, NASL season one finals of StarCraft. It was an international tournament where they had half the bracket was Korean, the other half basically was European. And uh, Rhett came in for a BO5 against Puma. I still Puma cheesed this. him, cheesed <laughs> him in record time. It was like a 15 minute series where Puma won 3 0. And Rhett was wow. just like, all right, I guess I'm chilling for three days now because I flew in, <laughs> flew in from the Netherlands to lose to Puma instantly. And Puma went uh-huh. on to win the whole tournament too. So that was like pretty brutal. There's no no loser's bracket, nothing like There's that. There's a lot so of drama like, after that. Any, I remember that. Yeah. Anytime I design a tournament or, you know, people ask me for advice, I always say more games is better just for fairness perspective and nothing feels worse to a competitor to just like in Overwatch, it could be one flubbed Zarya ult where um, Reinhardt got there in time to put his shield up and it's like, oh, well, we just lost the game uh, because <laughs> because we didn't land that Zarya ult or whatever it was. Like That feels bad. And at least having a second game where you can try to reverse your your ill-fated first game, that's like that's means so much to competitive teams. Cool. And how many times have you seen series where it's like uh, someone loses horribly the first game and goes on and wins the next three or whatever yeah. it is? Like That yeah. happens all the time. So BO1 just removes that possibility, and I think that sucks. So I'm going to be advocating BO3, uh, even for Overwatch, where it's like, I okay. understand like time is a constraint, and when you have a ton of teams, this game is actually terrible for time because uh, <laughs> you can literally win a match, f- defend for five minutes, then cap A, and you've won the map. So it's like a seven-minute total map. Or 
both teams go into mass overtime and it's a 35 minute plus map uh when you've got each game can go seven minutes or 35 minutes that's a <laughs> wild variance of it's like a whole side of the bracket can finish in an hour and the other side can finish in three plus hours like that's it's kind of ridiculous so if anything rule sets need to uh i think blizzard needs to be aware of that and make rule sets that make more sense for a consistent time like heroes actually has well, a very good handle on that so i would do you say think there should be like a, minutes. a overtime maximum or something no, like that. I mean, okay. I don't think I don't think there's any problem. It's just this the payload pushing stopwatch is just maybe not the best mode. <laughs> like we need to figure out maybe a point system or um, I don't know. It sucks because that is literally the most fair like um, objective way that you can measure something. It's like they both finished the map. This team finished it a minute faster. They are the better team by these rules, but um, just for competitive play it can it can make for a terrible viewing experience and it can make for a very awkward playing experience when you don't actually get to show your full potential or whatever it is i i think mixing modes is is cool um a lot of players are down on like the king of the hill maps in competitive but i feel like if they just get used to it and you know have their different strategy that's i think it's very nice for uh tournament viewers to to have the variety and it's definitely fun for casters if the ui just gets fixed up a bit i think king of the hill maps are great but people are they're gonna have to get used to new modes because i, I believe they've already been quoted that they're working on more modes and not just you know in refining stopwatch as as the end all be all Right. I mean, like you said about the co the uh, King of the Hell maps, those are, um, they're also really new too. Some teams are still, haven't really played as much on them. Um, I know, uh, I think it was, um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was in the the most recent Ghost of Gamers tournament. I think it was, I think they had Esper on there and he was saying how uh, they had banned out the Koth maps because they really hadn't had practiced on them as much. But it makes which makes sense. I mean, they, they that wasn't their they wanted to play to their strengths, so uh, it, was, it was good on them for doing that. But uh, teams haven't had as much time experimenting with it. I mean, there are some things that have been a little more tried and tested. That's kind of where some of the double Winston, double Reaper stuff really I felt started to originate. Maybe not, um, but there's certain certainly there were some characters that just really um, uh, catered to that that style of play. Uh, King of the Hill style of play in uh, in in smaller enclosed areas, I guess. Um, but I don't know about. Um, I I still don't I I don't think the best of one is a good way to go about it. But the thing is, and I want to ask this question to you guys: What do you think about what happens when more teams? Um, what happens when more teams? Get in the mix. What happens when the game is out to everybody? I mean, right now in in EU. Um, you know, there's, for example, there's 16 teams, and there'll be usually a few teams on reserve. For, for example, the Go the Ghost of Gamers EU tournament. Um, I'll use that as an example. What, you know, what happens when the game goes live? What happens when there's like 64 teams, maybe 128 teams? I mean, how many teams are we going to see signing up? I mean, what do you do for time then? I mean, are you just going to be doing a tournament the entire day? Well, I mean, at that point. It's there's a, there's a lot of variables, honestly. It's uh, how many different events are being run? How many different prize pools are there? Are, are the top teams going to try to split things up? If there's two five hundred dollar tournaments, if there's two five thousand dollar tournaments, whatever it is, um, do they do they coordinate and target different events that are happening at the same time? What is the actual um, prominent rule set? Like teams might just drift towards the way that the rule set for ESL or the rule set for GOSU, it, that's all going to dictate how big the events get. But like you said, time constraints, uh, best of ones might become crucial for, for those kind of situations. When you have 128 teams, best of one might be necessary for the first two rounds or something. But uh, to do that all the way up through quarters and even quarterfinals still having best of one, I don't know if that's necessarily necessary, at least right now. Yeah, there are a, f a few suggestions I see popping up in chat that are kind of in line with what I was thinking, which is when you get a, a tournament that's too big, you have to prioritize, like seeding obviously comes into play. You could yeah, do right. something like um, you can favor seeded teams, seed them further ahead so that they you know, don't waste time just bashing on lower seed, new new teams, etc. Um, you can also, you can run heats. MLG used to do that. Um, you can basically oh. turn a one-day tournament into a two-day tournament if you're 
essentially, if your prize pool makes sense for you to turn it into a two-day event, then you know some teams will not be able to compete because they, they have that. six people who can't play a whole weekend. And ESL did do that. Okay, so that you know there's precedent they did the for that SC2, already. Uh, the go for SC two cups. I remember because I right. used to compete in those. Yeah. So there's, I mean, there's various ways you can do it, but right now with with payload and overtime and all that, like just the the variance is enormous. Even for like, even for like a tournament finals, you, it's going to be very hard to schedule because, you know, even though you have the two best teams, that's the most likely that it's going to push to a super long, um, best of five, best of seven, whatever it is, and that's uh, that's going to be a trouble for tournament organizers, especially when there's already. ESL, Gosu Gamers, Creations doing a weekly thing, One Hit Club. Um, there's already, you know, four plus organizations trying to do regular content that mm -hmm. teams are not going to be able to play in everything. They're maybe only going to be able to play in one thing a weekend if they last, you know, five plus hours every time. And um, so far, <laughs> that's been the trend, even for these round of 16 events with double streams. Like, uh, we're we're not casting every single match, and it's still taking you know noon to about five thirty p.m. Um, yeah. for the for the NA cups with less than sixteen teams. So um, you're right. When it gets bigger, it's gonna be it's gonna be unwieldy. It's gonna have to to have like um, multiple streams, multiple admins just to keep track. Like thirty two teams is a hundred and fifty plus players that you've got to keep track of and make sure they're all coordinated and following all the rules correctly and not disconnecting in the middle of rounds like we don't even have good rules for, for that yet what happens when a player's monitor breaks halfway through a round or stuff something like that and they have to dip out is it just an automatic loss like there's no replay there's no pause it's 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 very very bare bones still uh, from the competitive aspect and all of that is going to add up toward ridiculous tournaments basically <laughs> for the time mm -hmm. being it is a beta so that's to be expected for sure but yeah, it's going to be interesting to see it all develop. I mean, but all right, let's let's continue moving on to the stopwatch. And that's as far as I understand, I actually didn't see anything in the ESL rulebook, but I believe it is the same where it's all stopwatch based uh, for payload. Um, so ghosts, I think they differ on their draw rules. So Gosu Gamers, in order to have just time efficiency and not have to replay maps a bunch, um, their draw rules were. If both teams, let's say on King's Row, both teams capture A, but neither team captures the first payload checkpoint, that would be a draw. And whoever wins the other map in the best of three wins the series. Huh. So it's essentially it's essentially a loss, or you could count it as a win for both teams or a loss for both teams, but essentially that's what's happening. Makes it a best so, of one. So, so it makes the next map a BO1, essentially. Huh. Um, and except for the finals and in the finals they say if that happens you actually take the time remaining uh, for each checkpoint so stopwatch matters on every objective only in the finals otherwise you know it's a it's a double loss or double win ESL i believe their draw rules were the old way of that we did in phase 1 where it's like every single checkpoint matters every single time uh, for time and distance basically so um Ties are slightly different, handled in both. I actually prefer the, I prefer measuring the time at each checkpoint because it just seems equivocally like the fairest to me. It is very difficult to keep track of that right now because Blizzard's UI doesn't really help you very much with that. You basically right. have to. Oh God, what was the time remaining? Oh God, what I missed? I missed the last checkpoint. So hopefully one of the thirteen other people in this game actually took note of it because, you know. If not, we have to go back and watch the VOD and like have some argument over was it one second short or one second fat, you know, whatever. That that stuff happened. It actually we've had a a matter of seconds determine winners multiple times already uh, with these draw rules. So um, stopwatch already is it's just kind of rough. Are so. there are there admins sitting in the game in one of the observer slots tracking that or not is typically. It, it's on the observer? It's on the actual caster? So the casters, the casters are always in the game, and the players are always like oh. asking questions, and it's always we always have to just say it's ask, like ask the admin, double check with the admin. Yeah. I have no idea. You almost We're absolved of responsibility. It's really rough not having an actual admin in the game doing that, and I know that's There's a lot no of extra work right anyway. So it's already like it's very you can't like communicate. You don't have time to communicate when you're in the game anyway. Yeah. That's rough. <laughs> yeah, that's it just rough. needs more features and more. Uh, uniformity, I guess, but they're, the nice thing is, like, the King of the Hill maps have no time they have no time component, it's right. just uh, whoever just wins, which is nice More design more maps like that, Blizzard, and we'll have less problems. Do you think a Slayer could ever be compelling in Overwatch? 
Yeah. <laughs> I mean, literally everyone has the same access to all the same heroes. So yeah, if, if some overwhelming composition appears, just do it better than they do it. And there's enough rock, paper, scissors, lizard, Spock in this game where you can fucking figure it out and Dude. encounter whatever whatever shows up. Spo, what are your thoughts on Capture the Flag? Would Winston be too OP? <laughs> Um, I think they need to do it a little bit differently. Um, I can use World of Warcraft as an example. When they did the capture the flag in there, um, they had it so uh, you can use certain abilities when you had the flag. So maybe they can make it so, for example, right. Tracer can't blink when she has the flag. Oh, so God, it, I think of Tracer. Yeah. So <laughs> maybe, was, uh, maybe uh, movement <laughs> abilities aren't able to be used. Who knows? It's it would have to be it would be have to be something that's tweaked. I mean, not everything would ha- would be actually have to be allowed. Maybe it slows you and have the flag. Totally. Right. That's that was the one suggestion that I heard that I liked the most, where it was like, capture the flag is scary because all these characters have different mobility, and it's like, yeah, yeah but if you if you have the flag, just make them take more damage or not be able to use abilities or only be able to you know run horizontally and not climb walls and <laughs> shit like that and maybe it'll be fine because then it does become um you know you would want your tanks to cap to be holding the flag that in that case rather than right. a tracer with 150 health or maybe it just maybe it just uh makes whoever's holding the flag more uniform where it's like whoever's holding the flag has 300 hp because they're holding this whatever it is this item it doesn't have to be a flag it could be like mm-hmm. a shield some kind of barrier or something like that that makes whoever's holding it slower and more tanky something like that could happen where then your comp your comp is still important. Like Tracer can get to the flag more quickly, but she can't escape easily with it. Or, um, you know, it, it still has a ton of different options for variety, but it doesn't have to be straight up capture the flag. It could just be some objective that exists on the map that can be tug of war style. Um, just dress it up to look look cool. And I think that I I personally don't have an issue with uh, X, Y, and Z characters are not viable in this mode. As long as you've got some mode where they are valuable, like May is more valuable on King of the Hill maps than she is on payload maps, uh, you know stuff stuff like that. I'm totally fine with. I I know Blizzard obviously wants all their their children, their characters to be loved and played as much as possible. But um, yeah, that's not not a concern for me in competitive <laughs> play. Well. We'll, we'll see if they ever add those two modes. All right, we have one final topic here in rule set discussion, and this is probably the biggest one of all of them. Uh, heroes, all heroes allowed for Gosu gamers, and there are no restrictions. But on the side of ESL, you're limited to one of that hero per team. So you can't do the double Winston, double Reaper, double Lucio. Can't do that. That's not an option. And that's going to promote more diversity in the game in general, in my opinion. But I'm curious as to what you guys think about that topic um i a couple things i think first off that differing in rule sets is fine i think especially at this stage of the game uh i think the competitive community needs to figure out kind of what is the standard for tournaments you know what works the best so i think doing these different different rule sets is good being able to find out okay is this better or is this option better or maybe there's a third option that that's better same thing with you were talking about stopwatch is stopwatch the end all be all let's try different things um so on that front, I think that it's good that we're trying different things. I also, I, so on the other hand, though, it's is it could also be it could be detrimental as well in the long term if you have, um, for example, if you're limiting heroes because then you kind of, I know that the double double Winston, double Reaper, double so isn't exactly the most excited thing, but I mean, who's who's we talked about this earlier? Who's gonna, who said that's going to be the meta forever? Sure. There's no, there's nothing that says that this is going to be around forever. This could just be, you know, a fading fad. You know, over the next, maybe we'll see something new next week. You know, there's, it's you got to give players time to adjust and teams time to adjust to ways to counter it, ways to deal with it, learning to deal with it, things like that. Um, there was uh, back when I played uh, World of Warcraft. There's also a a comp called a a team composition that was. Famously known as Beast Cleave, and this was just this was a <laughs> I played this that. was a uh, yeah this was a composition where you would these you'd pick certain uh, you had certain classes. You know, there was a, it was a hunter, shaman, paladin, and, and even those for those who don't know the game, it was just it was a YOLO comp essentially. You would just you would pop your cooldown, you just go down. yeah you just you face just go at them yeah you would just you just try to face roll them, and that was essentially the comp, and it was really strong when it first came out. And people didn't know how to deal with it. Everyone was crying for nurse, saying it's OP and stuff. And it was strong. I'm not going to lie. Uh, but it's, people just needed to learn to deal with it, really. It's, it's, it was something new that 
these people just didn't know how to deal with. It was just it was it was so much damage. Like, okay, how do we actually deal with this comp? But um, you know, within the within a few weeks, we had it figured out. We were one of the first teams to do it, and it was no longer really a problem. So it's I think it's just something that the competitive community needs to be able to figure out first before uh, there's any knee jerk reactions to it. Josh? Yeah, I think. Um people are referencing in chat the scrims that have been happening already since that tournament on Monday and Tuesday. Um, some of the players are streaming. Definitely check out the competitive Overwatch uh, stream team and you'll see a lot of really good players streaming. But basically they've been doing scrims and um, Junkrat has actually been p coming out in the scrims and being successful against the Winston Reaper yes. stuff. Um, traps traps are really good for Reapers and yep. Winstons. If you get in close range, you just drop a trap on them and shell them with the Junkrat bombs. Um, Junkrat has his own getaway where he can use his concussive mind to get away. Stuff like that. He blows up bubbles really well, Winston bubbles. And I mean, that's Junkrat fell out of favor because he was generating ultimates for the other team in phase one. Now he's not. And now he's actually, you know, an okay counter for a ground based. Uh, Assault force, I guess you could say, with with traps and concussive mines, you can kind of dislodge them and um, blow them up quickly. So, uh, yeah, there's, I think there's plenty of room to figure out counters. I don't think that the single single character limit is necessary uh, at the moment. I actually just don't like it at all. Um, I felt okay. like even even diva spam back in the day, I felt well, I was fine with that because diva spam very rarely actually won the game it actually stalled and it gave them better odds which is the entire point of switching characters is to try and help your chances of winning but it very rarely actually did anything just constant diva explosions they're still you know out of their suit most of the time and you're able to kill them it, it i think it worked maybe 20 percent of the time so it's just a valid strategy every everything is a valid strategy in my opinion until literally nothing can beat it and we've never seen that and i don't think we ever will because yeah every character there's 21 there's 21 heroes they can't all be you know terrible at killing winston um <laughs> or else the game sucks right and it doesn't suck it's it's actually really well balanced in my opinion you see a lot well, a lot of those 21 characters every weekend so i think they're doing a good job on balance they're they're taking an active look at each character we had a patch that changed may's icicle from four shots to five that's something i would never even have thought of but it does <laughs> make her feel slightly better right because mm -hmm. you can shoot five times before you have that long uh twist reload whatever it is so um they're making Some balance changes to try and discourage people from making this rule set in my opinion mm -hmm. i i Right now, I think it's it's not necessary at all for one hero limits. I'll be honest. I, I'm really I'm really torn on this topic, and it's really interesting hearing you guys give those different points. But it's just like the one hero limit is nice just because diversity is good, and for the spectators seeing a variety of heroes, especially if you're a main of a hero that's not really seeing much play. Like I, Junkrat's my boy, man. I spray and pray for days. <laughs> that, that's how I that's how I go. And you know, not seeing him pretty much ever in competitive once in a while, but he's very uncommon. I feel like the single hero uh, limit would promote more junk rep play in some situations. Uh, but at the same time, I still love the idea of a six Winston defense for that desperate defense at the end or whatever it ends up being. You know, the the, the capability of doing that kind of stuff, the capability of the, 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 the pincer attack of two Ferris coming from opposite sides with their ults or something. There's some really cool stuff that teams could do. So... We'll have to just wait and see. Obviously, having different formats and different tournaments is actually just healthy for the game in general, I think, because it's going to allow teams to really try out the two different styles, and then all the top players can express their feelings towards that. And then, you know, obviously the competitive scene will basically be molded around whatever Blizzard decides. So, and hopefully Blizzard will will listen to the community, listen to the pro players uh, based on what they like from the different styles in the game. And ultimately, when they Blizzard has their sanctioned events, they'll have their rule set, and that will become the standard. I mean, but in the early stages, I just I love the fact that we have these two different rule sets between these two events that are happening. And um, yeah, I don't know. Of course, yeah, let me. I'll clarify actually that I do like that they're trying different rule sets. Yeah, I just don't personally like best of one or the character limits myself. Uh, so definitely keep. Keep an open mind and watch these tournaments and provide feedback, all you viewers yeah. who are watching these tournaments. Like, literally, it's the same as the beta feedback for every yeah. character balance. If you like something, let them know. If you don't like something, let them know because vocal people are the ones who get the most back. And this is the time to try things. It is beta. 
rather do it now for uh, for when the release comes for everybody else. Yeah, definitely. So, well, our our last topic of the day is a bit of a community roundup. Unless you guys have any final thoughts on rule sets. I think that's it. Just I like I like the variety, um, but as we as we see more, you know, I I can make better judgments on whether I like or don't like specific things. Keep cool. it up. Okay, that is definitely the wrong graphic that I just hit. Hashtag production <laughs> and a community roundup. This topic is is just straight up rambling about all the new and great things that we're seeing in the community um a shout out again we talked about a lot of websites we've got one hit club we've got esl gaming we've got overpone we've got ow fire uh liquipedia there's tons and tons and tons of websites out there then there's a lot of cool stuff that's being created between fan art and new products being released like these brand new funko pop toys (laughs) that i want so badly yeah, dude. I <laughs> look at the Winston. I want that Reaper. The Winston looks like a frog. Why That's they make why him I like it, dude. He looks like Kermit. That's not what Winston looks like. But <laughs> I have I actually on this <laughs> this shelf back here. I actually have all the existing uh, Blizzard Funkos. So I definitely yeah, have really? to get these. Really, you're Overwatch try hard. Ones. That's not try hard. I used to work at Blizzard. They they were like candy there. Everyone everyone had them. But um, I hate Tracer. But I, I like all the the Blizzard ones so far, and uh, these these are no exception. Tracer looks pretty funny. Reaper, I like. Widowmaker, they made her head larger rather than her booty, so I don't know if they did <laughs> yeah. that, if they're, if they're unfamiliar with the character. Right. Uh, and Winston looks like a frog, but I'll get them all. <laughs> uh, pretty dope. Pretty dope. Um, I have something else, but I need a moment to pull it up. Where's sure. there's a Junkrat on there? Would you, uh, would you buy that one instantly? Oh, Junkrat, of course. Dude, he's my if boy. he came with like a little mine, too, that you could put Tracer in, <laughs> just trap it in I was thinking trapping Winston. I think that'd be a lot better. <laughs> Almost uh, there. But yeah, lots of cool stuff coming out. I've seen, obviously, the uh, Overwatch subreddit is really great for artists um, that have been making a lot of cool fan art. And yeah. uh, lots of cool play of the game, random stuff, random bugs, videos all get posted up there. And um, I know that Hysteria had like a really good diva ult over the wall of Lee Jang Tower. <laughs> oh, yeah. Got super the slam powerful. dunk. Yeah, that was um, pretty good. And just the more, yeah, the more games that we play, the more ridiculous stuff is going to come out. Like uh, D Guns, uh, three sixty sniper shot. I don't know if anyone saw that one on Reddit the yeah. other day. Um, stuff like that. That's where the frag videos are going to get really good. So far, we've seen some frag videos where it's like, oh, that one was from a match, but the rest are from pubs and just random. You know, you hit one rocket a mile away, and it's like that could happen yeah. one in a thousand rockets. Yeah, sure. But Anyone you got it that. on tape. That's what matters. But exactly. <laughs> so that's that's all we're seeing right now. But in the future, these guys are going to get good enough to hit these spinning widowmaker shots and flick flick rockets consistently, and it's it's just going to get better and better. And I'm excited for that aspect <laughs> as a content creator. My friend Toki Monster, I think you know her too, actually, yeah. Shashi. Um, she's been doing artwork of her mods as their favorite <laughs> characters in the game, and like, oh my goodness, That's the Symmetra good. and the Junkrat one. They're they're both uh, gender bend ones they're just so funny to me they're so good but yeah the <laughs> semester slayed me dude i just giggled like a little girl, school girl <laughs> lots of good stuff um is a, nibs is, nibs official is a really good one too let me pull that up what's the Nyata holding in that picture anyway is it like a fruit with a fork in it or yeah something? i don't think it's like an it's ice cream or something ice cream. all right so check this link out i'm gonna link it actually in the chat as well um, Nibs is the guy who made my little Ask Joshi logo, and he actually is an incredibly good artist. Oh, damn. Um, he's now made uh, vector art for Reaper, Demon Hanzo, and Genji, like Battle Scarred Genji, basically, and they all look really good. Yeah. Uh, wow. Yeah, that's really so, good. Nibs is just going to keep making that shit. He made he made Genji because Poke asked him um, just to make Genji, and I feel like he's going to do the whole cast at some point. But um, that guy's got some incredible art, dude. I'm Prop, props to Nibs. I'm in love with the Genji. It's sick, right? It is. I, I need to commission him to make some really cool stuff. It is very cool. That's not over. Um, much. Get me out of here. <laughs> that Reaper is pretty awesome. So, any any general topics you guys would like to to rant about pertaining to the game? 
This is just an open discussion. Spo? So, Spo, if there's anything, anything that you would... Anything driving you crazy? Yeah. <sighs> um... Feelings as to what the game should do, needs to do. Um, feelings about what the game shouldn't do. I guess I guess uh, some of my main concerns, I had written an article on this a little while back, where some of the things that I felt, some of the big, the big things that were missing uh, from Overwatch, I mean, we constantly hear things about a ranked mode. I mean, that's it's brought up in topics all over the place, whether it's on Reddit, uh, whether you're talking about know, people saying stuff in game, whether it's on other, you know, on podcasts and stuff like that. There's always people bringing up, you know, the ranked mode and stuff like that. Um, I think one of the biggest hurdles for the community, and and also the competitive community, is how you go go about finding um, player. You know, if you want to, if you're looking for a team or you want to put together a team, is how you go about finding some of those players. Because in some other games, uh, you could just say, you know, League, for example, or something like, or a game along those lines, you can. I mean, there's a there's a there's a ladder system, so you know all the best players are playing at the at the top of the at the you know the highest echelons of 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 competitive play, so you get to you get to see these players a, a lot, you get to play against them a lot. It's a lot harder to do that when there aren't things like you know things like you know for example stats or or, or some kind of ranked mode where you can um, where you can get a little bit of information on how people play in games and stuff or how effective they are. You can't always tell in games, so. Uh, certainly, you can tell by watching people sometimes, uh, but that's—I feel like that's the only part of it. So I—I I really want just replays and a replay editor. I think would be sick, um, yeah. so that the tournament organizers can actually gather them and and put them out as a replay pack, and you can actually watch. You know, right now we've got if Fish Sticks and I cast a match. You get his perspective and my perspective. Sometimes it's in third person, sometimes it's in first person. We miss so much of the match <laughs> yeah. because there's only two of us and there's 12 of them. It's just impossible. With replays, you literally can spectate the Zarya the whole way through, see what Zarya is actually doing. If you want to become a better Zarya player or a better Genji or a better whatever, you learn all their routes, you learn all their timings on using abilities. All that stuff is going to help improve people's play so much compared to what we have right now. And uh, Replay Editor, just for content creation aspect, if you can move the cameras around and make make some cool cinematic stuff, that's going to help uh, that content creation and uh, let's Call of Duty. Call of Duty is a community that thrived on YouTube frag videos and like oh, yeah. cool stuff, and it's because they have you know a few options when it comes to making something really cool. And uh, Source Filmmaker, of course, yeah. people are making Overwatch Huge. stuff already in Source Filmmaker. They should be making it in the Overwatch Filmmaker that doesn't exist yet. But that's something that I would really love. Um, and the last thing for me is from casting all these matches, I would love to just have in first person when I'm spectating a player, the same stats that I get when I'm playing myself, when I hit tab to see eliminations, killing blows, damage done, healing done, all that, all that stuff needs to be visible to casters as well, because currently, uh, when a match ends, the only stats that we have at all for a whole match are just the four cards at the end. You can see, oh, this guy got 70% of the kill participation. He actually had an insane game, but we had no idea when we were watching it because mm -hmm. we just happened to be watching the wrong guy or whatever it was. So right. stats on the fly, just like when we're playing in the game, would be incredible for casting. So uh, in the ahead. game, we only have an individual stat, and we only have like whether we're sitting in first, second, or third or below that point. Um, do you think this needs to be more like a MOBA where it's comprehensive is like an actual like every player these are their stats like with Heroes of the Storm you, you hit tab and you get the list of all 10 players in this case you get all 12 players and you'd have those five categories uh, or six categories when you include deaths do you think that that's how they should do it where you just see that number value for every person and then the medal there respectively if they've earned it at least yeah I mean uh, any kind of scoreboard that specs only can see would be fine yeah uh, just something where we can literally right. like see see what's happening. Like even League of Legends has an unobtrusive um, LCS scoreboard kind of at the bottom that shows yeah. KDA. I want that. I want something because it shows KDA how much gold they have. We don't. There's no item builds outs or anything like that, so yeah. we don't need that much information. But something that I can just hit uh, Shift A or something and pull up a quick glance and see oh my god this mccree actually is the one we should be watching because he's just going off let's swap to mccree's first person view stuff like that and for the, on the players and the players part too i think it's i mean some of that information is really nice too but you have to consider um 
like for example, ranked ranked versus casual mode. Um, if you're if you're just playing casually, uh, do you want you know do you want should people have access to all that all that data? And ranked mode, I'd say yeah, and casual mode, I'd say probably not. Uh, oh. Ranked mode, it's nice to be able to have inform I'll have that additional information, especially for like you said, you were saying, Joshi, um, especially for um, uh, shoutcasters and for uh, in, in, for the spectators, being able to see that stuff, people who are watching these games, it's it is really important to be able to see these extra data. I mean, you look at traditional sports. I mean, look at all these. There's all these different types of stats. It, we always hear about the really odd stat, you know, like so and so is the only you know is the only person in ten years to get you know three points in you know five seconds or whatever. <laughs> Just you know, you, you, these really ridiculous stats. They try yeah. to make something important of the game. You know, say okay, there's something really amazing happened this game. There's always something like that, but it's you know, if you don't have access to that data in the first place, it's really hard to be able to even yeah. say, oh, you know, wow, you know, this, you know, this, uh, this tank had a really solid game. You know, he was, he, he was, he was getting all these clutch plays and stuff. And you know, his damage, he was, he had, he had top, wow, he had top damage on the team in that game. Like, how, how did this happen? And you, you can kind of focus some discussion around that stuff. We don't really have those access to those. We don't have access to those metrics. Um, and, and uh, so it. You can't have that kind of discussion at the moment. There's there's a lot of room to expand that even further um, if they if they build it properly. And you, once those numbers become a tangible thing, and those numbers right. start to become something that's intuitive, like the average damage done in the game, let's just say it's ten thousand, right? That's that's our reference point. And you know that's a good number to do. Then mm -hmm. you see this guy. It's like, oh my goodness, he averaged twenty five thousand damage in that game. That's actually absurd. But then you you go from having this this average damage and stuff that's within the client, and you go to like damage absorbed and one team fight. You see the push happening on point A and Reinhardt managed to absorb two ults with his shield and mm -hmm. sure, oh yeah, I guess the shield has a maximum of how much damage it can absorb, but still, you know, that hero had blocked X number of damage in that situation and to be able to pull that up after the fight to just kind of recap that play and give that play some more tangibility as to how important it is with a number, it's quite valuable if they can do that. Yeah, so, I, yeah I oh, this is one you made, okay. Ooh. Yeah, I actually designed one a while back. I posted, I can't, I think I posted this, I want to say during phase one of beta. I just made a mock-up of what something looked like. Obviously, there's some issues with it. It, was, oh, I actually saw it wasn't this. perfect, but um, yeah, I did, decided to make it a while back. I was just like, just kind of help jog around, uh, just give people some ideas, kind of about, you know, what, you know what, do, what do people like, what don't people like, what's too much. Is it is it too much? Is it not enough? Uh, you know what? Just what kind of things do, pe do people want? There was also someone else had uh, designed another one too. I, I can't remember who it was, um, but it was also on uh, also on the subreddit. So um, there's some there's some other good ideas and people you know people with great ideas out there. And you know it's it's great to see it's great to see things like that. I love the attention to detail. Just putting the fire in there as well. Uh, yeah, I would man, that would be so nice to be able to pull that up during the game. Uh, Joshi just linked a Funko toy. Oh my yeah. goodness! So oh, this is a soldier one. This says seems like there is a GameStop exclusive Overwatch pop vinyl. So GameStop exclusive oh sold soldier pop also. <laughs> but yeah, the scoreboard looks really good, and that is something like exactly like that that would be just great at a reference for casters. Well, we can hope Blizzard will <laughs> continue Anytime. adding features. I'm sure they will. The game's only in beta. Is, is the spectator client their next big thing? I, I know they so did a lot with the, a lot with custom games. They did a lot with those. There's all these options in, in the custom games, which is great. I, I I think I don't think anybody disagrees with that. It's great to have all these different options and stuff available. Um, I, I honestly think they're putting a lot of effort toward modes. Like they want yeah. they want mass variety at release, yeah. and then they can tune everything else. I think is is their strategy right now. Just the most. The most things that people can play and have the one thing that they're good at, I think that's what they want is so that they can have a good uh, fly trap and everyone can find, I really like playing Junkrat in King of the Hill maps and I'm going to queue only as Junkrat, only on King of the Hill maps, if, if that's possible. <laughs> so that's that's something that they want, though, because you know it's different strokes for different folks and they want to provide every possibility to people who aren't good at FPS, who are good at FPS, you know. All, all walks of life, and, and that's a, a good strategy for, for a box model because they're going to get that 40 bucks out of them and then maybe some cash for skins and stuff like that, but essentially they need as many people to try the game as possible with this model. I, 
I actually got a question for you guys. I wanted you to uh, guys to weigh in on this. Um, this actually ties into some of the, a little bit of discussion we had earlier. Um, we we're just talking about the custom games, all the options. What would you think about um, if if there was, let's say, a ranked mode? What would you think about people being able to choose a couple maps that you don't play on? I know in Warcraft Three they had this option where you could thumbs down maps Same when you were too. playing on solo yeah. queue. What about something like that in Overwatch? No, I want that now because we have ten maps and I would never play Hanamura again. <laughs> I was <laughs> what about my Anubis? suggestion. I think, I think for, fine. for ranked, <laughs> for ranked, definitely. Um, for for casual, I, I don't think it's necessary. I think casual should be one one press play kind of thing, where it's very just you yep. just click click to play. Yeah. Um, but I think for ranked, it's almost essential. But the hard so thing casual. Is, is, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say hard the hard thing. thing is when you have a uh, a group, and if there's like a, a lot of you know disparity as to mm. who's upvoting what in your group like how how do you do that because you're talking about warcraft you're talking about starcraft you're generally solo queuing yeah um, i had games. i thought of that same issue too and that's why uh, we i had just talked about it i have a lot of discussions streaming 110 levels of overwatch <laughs> with all, all my stream viewers and uh and people i play with but basically the idea that we came up with was basically you just um, instead of vetoing maps or like thumbs downing, you put favorites. So if uh, my favorites are all King of the Hill maps and Hype's favorites are all payload maps, whatever, it could look at the combination of everyone's favorites and awesome. try to select something that way rather than saying, oh, we can't play because Spo has this thumb down and Jake has this thumbs down, but there's some like disparity. So someone's going to be sad. Otherwise, I think just like fa favoritism points would, would work better so that they could actually just say, okay, the highest rated map among all 12 players in this lobby is Numbani. Let's go play Numbani or, you know, something like that I think would be cool. Um, but you're right. In ranked, I think um, vetoing maps would be good. That's something that heroes drives me insane. You can literally queue in and get the same map. Yeah. They have fucking, they have a dozen maps. Why am I playing Blackheart's Bay every single time? I hate it. <laughs> Mine was Haunted Mines. Was, uh, Rip that coins, map. man. Coins are the worst thing in the world. They... Like when to turn them in, how to turn them in. People just run all over the map trying to get coins, yeah. and then they just die People and lose to eight turn of them. them in like, solo when it got drives like me of them. Oh, insane. <laughs> Worst map ever. But anyway, that's a, that's a tangent for another time. But there, <laughs> I get the same feeling from Hanamura now, where it's like if I'm playing for hours, I'm playing hours on my stream and not right. getting the map that I like. It sucks. I I hate it, and I get Hanamura all the time. I'm with you. If I could just play King of the Hill. I'd be the happiest man alive. Dude. Yeah, dude. I, I, I actually get like giddy. I'm like, yes, finally, Nepal. I like, see the same exact thing. See yeah. Steve last night. We played for maybe three, four hours, and he's like, damn, we didn't get a single one. He left, and we got Li Zhang Tower right after. Like, <laughs> no. You can't, make that, you can't make that up. Like, stuff happens. It sucks. Oh, man. Awesome. Well, uh, some good discussion today for sure. I think that pretty much covers the community. Run oh, except for one topic that was posted in the chat. Achievements. Uh, yes, achievements, achievements. Ooh. So is that confirmed? Because I missed that post. I missed that post too. I don't know what happened, but I, I all I've seen so far is some tweets and some chatter about yeah. the achievement system that they've apparently mentioned in an interview somewhere. That's um, but really I got to say... Yeah, achievements are fine. I'm totally cool with achievements. Um, it's, it's just more stuff for people to do, more reason to yeah. be playing the game. And World of Warcraft had a bajillion achievements. I didn't try all of them. I oh, tried God. the ones that were, you know, <laughs> I, that give me the cool mount or give me the cool title or yeah, whatever. Right. But I didn't. I was. <laughs> it was never a case of like now I have to play an orc rogue for a hundred levels or whatever. No, because I'm, I'm not going to do that. Uh, and most people won't do the ones that they they don't care for. Now, actually, that's an interesting point you brought up about um, some of those, some of the achievements. Now, I think it depends on what type of achievements you're talking about. I know that when Blizzard was, um, Blizzard really wanted people, like, for example, when Blizzard was designing the progression system, they have it, it's an overall progression system. For example, if, you, if you're playing Junkrat, you're not getting points towards Junkrat's cosmetics or something like that. You get, it's, an, it's progress across the board, so you can, you can get, you know, you can, progress across the board and then use those to, you know, use your, your coins to buy, for example, stuff on Junkrat. So you don't actually have to, you're not forced to play a certain character. You know, what if you're, uh, some of these achievements, I know in, this isn't in every, every game, but some of the achievements are like, you know, play X amount of games on this character or win X amount of games on this character. I mean, 
the, the way the game's designed, you don't it, it, you don't want people playing characters that are counterproductive to you know them winning the game just because they're going for achievements. And that's kind of what they did with the progression system. Like, oh, you know, I I want to do you know I need my 250 wins on Torb. Sorry guys, I'm playing Torb you already on offense. You know, let's let's go for it. Like it's I think there's some kind of middle ground that they'd be able to find. So depends what type of achievements I think. Um, what do you guys think of the idea? Like you were talking about Joshi, the idea of getting a title to unlock for an achievement. So achievements that unlock rare skins or intros or cosmetics, you think that would be, uh, yeah, just a good thing in general. Yeah. If they're, if they're generic things like win 50 games, win a hundred games, win, you know, where winning is actually the, the premise and not playing a weird style or, you know, just only, Providing Symmetra shields constantly because you need a million shields. That's I think they can do that. <laughs> I think I think it's totally possible. I could but your I could write down die. a list. You know, yeah, yeah. Just hey, everyone, just go die so I can provide more shields. Thank so, you. <laughs> but less excited about the idea of maybe a master skin concept of of Heroes of the Storm. You get level ten with uh, with junk with junk rat in theory, and you uh, you, you unlock. I don't his... really have a problem with that either. Okay. I think if as long as uh as long as you're able to earn credit toward that in casual mode. Um, maybe there's oh, yeah. even that needs to be. an un- unranked, like specific, like uh, anything goes kind of r- mode or rule room or I don't know, man. But there's there's definitely potential for. I, I'm not really too scared about the uh, the Torb mains hijacking all my games. I, <laughs> I feel like it's still going to be fine. <laughs> huh. Could be cool. Could be cool. Very exciting that achievements are on the way. Um, I know there's many achievement hunters that will just be hooked on that in general and that gives the game another kind of playability for a big audience for sure uh but we are just about out of time and it is time for our shout outs so spo let's start with let's start with you my friend um i just i'd like to thank you guys for you know, bringing me on here this is a lot of fun um shout outs to all the communities that are um are running tournaments or are creating content so you know Oh, for example, Wonder Club. Um, I've been writing there, doing a lot of content for them. So I'm glad uh, they gave me the opportunity to uh, to post stuff there. Um, you can follow me on, well, the stuff's right below my name, so there's that. But ultimately, uh, you know, just thanks for uh, bringing me on here. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming on, my friend. Yeah. Yeah, everybody definitely follow Spo. His Twitter there is on the overlay, Team Spo. Go check him out. And he's been competing in all kinds of different games, so Overwatch should be great for him as uh, he's got a lot of experience. And I want to see what team are you actually playing on now, Spo? Um, I've been playing with Prime for a little bit. Uh, it's with okay. Blam, uh, JKW, Kit Kats, and um, Mangachu. So awesome. we have a rotating six at the moment, but I've just been playing with them for a while. It's pretty yep. fun. So keep an eye on Prime in the upcoming uh, weekend tournaments and stuff like that. He's a really good Zenyatta. Spo is a really good Zenyatta. I always hate seeing him on the other <laughs> side. Um, he's very accurate. Uh, for myself, everything is just uh, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch slash Ask Joshi. I've been streaming Overwatch every night from between about mm, 6 p.m. Pacific to 3 or 4 a.m. Pacific. Thanks to all the people who've been coming to watch me. It's been a lot of fun building up a channel once again. I haven't really had this kind of excitement since I built the StarCraft II channel for YouTube back in 2010, and I'm really <laughs> enjoying myself. Uh, thanks again to Jake for having me as the co-host here on Town Hall Overwatch. This was a really good episode, too. I feel like we're starting strong. Episode 1 with Oplad was great. This was another really good one. Lots of good topics, and hopefully Overwatch will continue to evolve, and we have lots of topics uh, moving forward. Yeah, this is... Uh, yeah, I, I gotta say, just a big shout-out to... The community in general for the support. Uh, the first VOD saw very, very good, very strong viewership. So it's very exciting to have a show see immediate success for the first time. I've actually started a few shows now, and this show has, you know, it's it's well received. So I think a big part of that is thanks to our great guests and to you, Joshi, for, as the co-host, and it's very exciting. Looking forward to much more. Uh, a few announcements: we are we now do have an RSS feed, and we do have an MP3 available. iTunes is still pending. But for those of you that want to just listen to the MP3 uh, every week, you just want to download it for your commutes home, whatever that is, the SoundCloud is up and running. It's just soundcloud.com slash townhallovrowatch. So you can, I mean, if you're listening to the MP3, 
through, you're not going to see this this on the screen, but there is a pretty page where you can get all the info. So that's Brent Spanking New, and iTunes is still pending. So I hear you, everyone, requesting the MP3 episode one up there soon. Episode two will follow shortly. Spo, thank you so much for joining us this week because honestly, um, you're a just really fun talking to you, and that this map callouts that you created is such a fantastic resource. So again, I implore all of you to check that out. Once again, D the Hunter just posted it in the chat and it will be included in the description of the VODs and so on and so forth. And uh, yes, you can follow me at SolidJakeGG on Twitch, Twitter, YouTube, and I guess SolidJakeGG.com. I even have an Instagram now, so fancy. So yes, <laughs> all the things. Uh, we will be returning next week as long as everything doesn't explode. And I guess we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in. Bye, folks. See ya. Did I hit the wrong button? Oh, God. Yes. <laughs>